We're going to be talking with Jack Fleming, my father, who worked in San Bernardino Radio from 1959 to 1967. Hello. Good morning. Hello. What's up? I was going to ask you about the old radio days in San Bernardino. I don't remember any of them. Okay, well, this has been fun. Thank you very much. Okay, have a good day. Bye. Bye. <laughs> that was that was the least satisfying interview I've ever done. But the shortest. Yeah, it was wrapped up very quickly. That leaves a lot of room for advertising. If you can only sell it. That's going to be a tough sell. Well, um, I want to ask you about... San Bernardino Radio in the early I days. I know nothing about San Bernardino Radio. Uh, it, it sounds like actually you knew nothing about San Bernardino Radio when you f- first came out. 1959, is that correct, to San Bernardino? I never lived in San Bernardino. When you arrived in 1959, you probably knew nothing about the San Bernardino radio market or uh, what stations were there. You didn't have any job prospects, right? Actually, Mom, this is before computers, of course, Mom wrote to the San Bernardino Area Chamber of Commerce for a a list of the radio stations there. She got the job first. She got the job at the Chamber of Commerce. Ha! The very agency she had written to for brochures, correct? Yeah. They sent us a, I think we had, I don't know, maybe half a dozen, wrote to L.A., San Bernardino, uh, San Francisco, San Diego. So you packed up everything you owned and drove across the country, mostly on Route 66, destined for a place that you picked because they had the nicest brochures. That's right. And then you went looking for a radio station? Right. And I wound up at KRNO because most of the other stations needed a what they call a first-class license. And all I had was a restricted operator's permit. What's the difference? Well, anything over one tower, you need a first-class license. Outside of uh, KRNO, they were all multi-towered. How many watts were you pumping there at KRNO? Uh, A thousand watt daytime, 250 night. And the other stations? Well, like KFXM was 5,000. KFXM did exist when you uh, arrived in 1959. Oh, yeah, they were the big rocker. Okay, so they were going strong. There was no KMEN yet. No, there was no KMEN. There was uh, a 1290 on the dial. It was K-I-T-O, Keto. Keto. They used to say, new Keto time, new Keto temp. So Keto's on 1290. You're at... 1240. You're at 1240 KRNO. So you're working at KRNO, and their format is what? They were rocking, but they were having a hell of a job keeping up with KFXM because KFXM had been a rocker for quite a while, and KRNO had just made the switch before uh, we went there. Why do you suppose they did that? Is it because rock and roll was where the money was or the listeners? Oh, yeah, it was a big fan. It was, a, you know, it, it was the music of the day. Oh, that rock and roll will never last. Right. It's the devil's music, I tell you. And it still is. Still is. Rock and roll will never die, Dad. That's right. So you're at, at KRNO. You say your first day was what? Well, well, let's see. We got there around July 1st. My first job at KRNO started about two and a half to three weeks after we got to San Bernardino. So July or August of uh, 59. Yeah. And then, wait till you hear this, I worked there until November, until they went automation. Oh, no. Oh, yes. You were replaced by a machine. I was replaced by a machine. So then I figured, well, what the hell am I going to do? So then I studied to get my new first class license. But in the meantime, I was selling insurance for a Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. What kind of stuff did you have to study to get a... Was it a first-class license you needed? It's very technical. A lot of technical stuff. Very technical, yeah. I studied through the Grantham School of Electronics, which was in Hollywood. But I did it through the mail. So correspondence school. Actually, it was a, a correspondence course. And how long did that take? Well, let's see. It 
took until very late in November. Oh, well, that's actually pretty quick. Yeah, I got very good marks because I'd gone to the Connecticut School of Electronics in New Haven. I had a very good background in electronics. Okay, well, you're a quick study. Actually, I was. So you got your first class radio operator's license, and then you went and made the rounds to the various other stations? First of all, I applied at KFXM, and Roy Cordell told me, he said, do you have a first class license? I said, no. He said, well, you got a great voice. He said, but uh, unfortunately, we need all first class license people. And why was that? Was it the law? Yeah, it was the FCC law. Oh, okay. And then you went to other stations and heard the same thing? You had to have the first class license? Oh, yeah. I went to KCKC. I went to KFXM. I went to KITO. Nobody would hire me Hmm. until I got my first class license. Then I went to KFXM. My first air shift was New Year's Eve 1959 to 1960. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And I did such a good job, Roy said, we got to find a slot for you. You know what slot I, I started at? Where? Midnight to six. That's such a great slot. <laughs> but the money was a hell of a lot better than I was making at KRNO. Even with the, what is it, midnight to six? Mid- midnight to six a.m. And you were making better money than you were doing days at... KRNO. Oh, yeah. I was making $400 a month at KRNO, and Roy hired me at something like $570. Remind you, this is 59. Yeah. That was a lot of money in 59. Yes, it was. So I stayed at KFXM until 1964, and then I, I was doing a short stint back at KRNO. I, I went home, and uh, Mom said, you got a call from a guy... His name is Dick, I believe it was Yorkin. So I had the number, so I called him. And he said, I was flying over San Bernardino. And I heard you, and I think you will fit into our format. So uh, I worked at KGIL in Los Angeles. I, I, I stayed there about six months. And the reason I only stayed there six months, because I didn't want to bring you or Lisa to Los Angeles to live. So you wanted to raise us in San Bernardino. Absolutely. So then I, I went back to uh, KFXN again. I didn't stay there very long. Then I went to Casey Casey, and that's when they were a country. When was that? About 65? Uh, 65 to, I wanted to say 67, yeah. First of all, I had gotten a call from Fred, what the hell was his last name? Worked with him at came in for a while nice guy and he called me and he said jack i'm down here in san diego i'm the pd i'm gonna have a job opening mid days i know you would fit in just perfectly so we all went down to san diego and uh, had my interview with fred fred kimmel fred kimmel and a k-i-m-m-e-l he was a german guy that sunday we, we were driving back and uh, we got back into the house. Uh, honestly, Mike, we no sooner stepped into the house and the phone rang. And who was it but Roy Cordell? Yay, Stroker. Yay, Stroker. <laughs> and he said, yay, Big Jack. We're putting a 50,000-watt station on the air here in Eugene, Oregon. My first question was, where in the hell is Eugene, Oregon? <laughs> That's how I got to a KPNW. Now, I, I want to go back. You mentioned KMEN. Tell me the story of uh, the company that bought Keto. That was Coal Green Broadcasting. C-O-L-G-R-E-E-N, Coal Green Broadcasting. And they were originally out of Hawaii. And they bought Keto. They bought Keto and turned it into KMEN. Now, when was this? This would have been about 63 and that represents a big threat to KFXM because now you have two big rockers yeah. in the San Bernardino market. Yeah. At the time, you were still working at KFXM. Uh, I wanted to ask about the transition. Uh, you were working at KFXM, and then you ended up at KMEN. How did that happen? 
Well, I just looked, well, Bill Watson, who was the PD at that time, uh, made me a decent offer, which uh, was more money than I was making at KFXM. He wanted to buy off the best talent from KFXM. Is that the deal? That was the deal. Were you a big fish? Well, apparently they thought so. <laughs> <laughs> little, a big fish in a little pond. Yeah. <laughs> San Bernardino uh, being the little pond. Uh, so you took the money and went to KMEN. How long were you at KMEN? Well, actually, I, like I say, I was the news director. Uh, the name I had painted on the door was J. Michael Fleming. I like that name. I thought it was great. <laughs> well, so KMEN was just huge, right? They were huge, yeah. They were kicking ass all over town. You were working probably drive time. It was afternoon drive. It was two to six. Okay, and that's pretty much where you put your ace pitcher. Right. You were doing a radio show called Yay or Nay. Oh, we did Yay or Nay at KFXM back in the early 60s. Okay. Tell me what Yay or Nay was supposed to be. Okay. There were two big rockers in Los Angeles, KSWB and KRLA. Before they would break a new hit, because they didn't want to break something that just was a dud. Seriously, I have records which aren't even on vinyl. They're on acetate. They would bring these uh, records out. As a matter of fact, Sonny Bono was one of one of the guys. They would bring these records out to uh, KFXM, and we would air them on the nighttime show, and I did a yay or nay there. And then, uh, what, callers would call in and rate the record or, or say yay or nay? Yeah. And what would you do with the results? Well, then I'd give it to Roy, and Roy would call the record pluggers and tell them that either it was a hit or going to be a stinker. <laughs> Did Sonny bring you any stinkers? Yeah, every once in a while. But there were a lot of record pluggers. There was Sonny Bono and Red Baldwin and uh, a whole bunch of guys. Well, if the record was a hit on your show and the audience said yay, then right. what would happen with that hit in L.A.? Oh, well, then they'd put it on the air and play the hell out of it. Do you recall any of those records then going on to national success? Oh, many, many, many. Oh, yeah. I thank you very much for your reminiscences and your wonderful stories of the old radio days. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, I love you. I love you, too. Talk to you later, Mike. Uh, Bye-bye.